the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. In addition, today, as always, we're on Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Our television stations are on Comcast, Channel 15, and AT&T, Channel 99. We're also on the radio in the greater West Bloomfield area, 89.3 Lakes FM, and in the Bloomfield Hills area on 88.1 WBFH, The Biff. Online and HD on civiccentertv.com. Click on our Watch Live link at the top right of our home page or on the left side of your screen if you're watching us from a mobile device. In addition, we are on Facebook. As always, facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash lakesfm. And joining me today, as always, in our West Bloomfield studio is Ronnie Dahl. Welcome to another soggy... Friday yeah. here in the D. Yeah, lots of puddles. I slipped a few times. I walked over here with our Zoom producer, Ryan, today uh, from West Bloomfield Parks' this parking lot, and uh, I, I slid a few times. I didn't fall, so it wasn't, that, it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> as funny as it could have been, but you know, still. I will say, uh, so here's the thing uh, for guys. You really get a pass we on do. the weather because, uh, you know, you do your makeup, you do your hair. But then when you're walking over and in this weather and it's, I will say, so it's operating by the time I walked over, but it's like that dreary, that misty. Yeah. And so it's like, why did I bother? Why did I bother? And then um, there's got to be something in the air that I'm allergic to because okay. um, for the last few days, my eyes have been watering like crazy. So then you have these puffy red eyes. <sighs> Happy Friday. Yes, yes. Finally Friday. It's been a long been a long week. Well, I was talking, even talking <laughs> just with uh, Ryan yesterday. We did the West Bloomfield Parks meeting last night, and you know, just at some point uh, after that meeting, we both just like, God, it just felt like Friday today for some reason. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, it's because it felt like Wednesday by Monday afternoon. It's been a crazy week. I, it has, and I will say though, uh, when I woke up, I saw the weather was like it was, and I have been in Apple hell for the oh, past no. day. So last week, I went out on my new paddleboard and um, put my phone in a waterproof case mm -hmm. but I think at one point I pulled my phone out and then the moisture got in there so not only did I lose my debit card floating around oh, in Seven Lake okay. somewhere but then my phone must have gotten a little bit of water and apparently I had dropped it before so there was a crack in it and so it's been like a ghost phone all week. I don't, have you ever had that where your phone just like open randomly and calls people? And yeah, my last phone would randomly open apps and just have it freeze on them. Uh, that was toward the end before I had the I switched over to my current phone. But uh, yeah, I've had that. I've had that before. It's very weird. It's very odd. You kind of think to yourself, does my phone have a virus? So you start doing <laughs> all these different virus scans and trying to you know does my phone clean out all. Right? Does my <laughs> does my phone have COVID? Do I have mobile COVID? That sounds like a much <laughs> Like a very bad variant. It's now spreading the phones. It's, it's the Delta variant that's oh happening to our yes. phones. It's the uh, so, and you know, and I always say I'm divorcing Apple. Sure. It's a bad we relationship. It's an abusive relationship. I keep saying I'm going to divorce Apple, but yet here I am redoing the Apple thing. So I had the insurance, so I was able to get a new phone. They send the phone. I start to set it up, um, which then takes hours. Uh, mm -hmm. So I had to go to volleyball last night, and, and you know, like my niece, it, pe because she plays with us now, sure. couldn't get a hold of us. Everyone's like, "Where's Ronnie?" I had to leave my phone because it was like two and a half hours sure. into it. Right. So I leave it, come home. It had at least finished that portion, but then trying to pair the watch has been a nightmare. So I was up early on uh, the phone with Apple support. So now I have to go to Apple tonight. Um, but then my. It, Air, the AirPods aren't sinking. Uh, oh, and here's the other thing. You have to know all your passwords. Right. And, you know, I always say, save my password. I hit the little button, save mm -hmm. my password. No, nope, no, nope, not for everything. No. I don't know. Right. So then you're, like, trying everything under the stars, you know. I'm like, oh, so yeah. I just gave up. Yeah. Today I wore right. my cutoff shorts and a sweatshirt. I'm like, look. It's Friday. Right. It's Friday. You know, you're in Apple hell. <laughs> this is why people use password as their password. It's, it's, see, it's the company's fault, not the people's fault. Because, you know, you got to remember all these passwords. And even when you save them in your phone and you're switching to another device, but you sync it up with your account, you remember the main password. It has all the other passwords under it. Where do they go? They're still not there. Now i got to remember all my passwords. Come on. Oh, it, it, it really is. There is such a thing as, uh, you know, yeah. PTSD password. Yeah. 
PTSD yeah. because I think everyone says passwords are going to be the death of them. And I remember working for the federal government and we had so many different systems and you had to update them every yeah. 30 days, I think it was, and you couldn't use like variations of the last one or something. Yeah. So it, it was just such a nightmare. And then there was, don't write it down. <laughs> what are you supposed so to do? How am I supposed to remember so it then? They would occasionally do like these office audits where they would send someone through. <laughs> And be like, oh, right. did you walk out of your office with your computer open? I always did. Sure. Um, and, and I basically, I will say, I almost only used my um, work computer back then for email. Because it, it's like, it, it was a PC, and I'm, I'm a Mac person. I can't do anything on a PC. Um, but they'd be, they would look to see if people had their passwords written down. Well, of course they do. Sure. You have to change them every 30 days. Right, no one's gonna remember some weird new cryptic password every 30 days. You're making them write, so yeah, they're gonna write it down. What, what, what you want them to do, tattoo it under their, their tongue and go in front of a mirror, flip their tongue up and remember the password then? No, they're still writing it down. Right. Come on. And, and, and I do use the program, save sure. my passwords, right? Yeah. And so you can go into Apple, oh, or Safari preferences, right. check, so your, check for them. Um, and when you look though, they don't save your passwords for your emails. So I have several different emails. Sure. And then I was like, I don't know. Right. So I'm without a phone, I'm without AirPods, but my phone is at least, I'd say 75% working. It, well, that's, that's better than you know, your phantom phone before. Oh, namaste. Yeah. And I, it, every time I go through this, because it, it shouldn't take hours, right? And every time I go through this, I'm like, this is it. I'm divorcing Apple. This is it. This is it. But then, you know, airdrop. It's airdrop. Yeah. Abusive relationship. Function. Airdrop keeps me hooked up. So I'm telling you, anyone out there with Android, because uh, my husband is an Android person, yeah. the phone in the camera on that phone is so much better. And, oh, it, yeah. you know, for iPhone to be like, look at what we can do with our camera. I'm like, Ugh. you're like, you know. 10 Galaxy, or he has the Samsung Galaxy, like okay. five episodes ago or whatever. Um, but there's nothing, and I know people say, well, there's Google. You can do Google Drops and Google sure. Video and this, that, and the other, but y it still doesn't work as seamlessly as AirDrop does. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm surprised still. And we've had this conversation off the air before. I'm surprised yeah. that uh, Android or that Google or that any of these other, co these other companies haven't come up with some similar system that is interchangeable just yet to be able to compete with AirDrop. That would, I think, drive a lot more people back over uh, or over to Android from using Apple products. I totally would have uh, made the switch, mm -hmm. and I've been using Mac for years, but I had to get a new um, computer because this one, uh, you know, Mac does that lovely thing where oh, yeah. they load it with crap, <laughs> you know, apps, and if you don't use them, you can't remove them, but it takes up your storage. Right. So then when they do all these updates, then your computer basically comes worthless, um, or your iPad or whatever. So um, I wanted to get, I had to get a new computer, which is on back order for like a month. And, um, but I was looking at doing the whole switchover, and no one has come up with that yet. And I'm really, really surprised because I'm like, why doesn't Samsung have right. like you know because i know surface book pro is kind of the one that they do that commercial where they compare themselves sure. to a mac and then the price is so much cheaper um but at the end of the day you don't have airdrop right it's come on bill gates yeah get there already <laughs> hey other than that though uh the olympics yes start today um, the opening ceremonies were really getting underway because obviously the time difference, but right. outside of the uh, stadium, uh, a lot of people in uh, Tokyo are protesting. Mm -hmm. They're very upset that they're holding the Olympics right now. Yeah, I mean, the people of Tokyo did not want this to happen because of the current COVID-19 situation. They're in Japan and, and Tokyo is a very busy city. It's a very compact city with a lot of, with a lot of people that are moving about. And even the, the government there in Japan wa was apprehensive about going forward with these games. And, and the problem there is that they can't alone say, we're, we're pulling out of the games, we're not gonna host them, we're canceling it or we're po postponing it. That can only be done by the International Olympic Committee that doing that for a second consecutive year uh, evidently was a non-starter for them. Yeah, and we should remember, uh, so they try to do basically what they did with the bubble, the basketball bubble. Uh, they did it with the Olympic bubble, but it did not work. Right. Uh, but it's a total different situation right. in that exactly. you have, you know, hundreds and thousands of people coming from 
how many different countries to participate. So it's kind of hard to maintain that bubble. And so uh, it's going to be interesting uh, to see if they make it through the games. Yeah, the wide world of Disney in, in Orlando, Florida for one professional sports league is a whole different ball game than a major international city for athletes coming from all over the world in a variety of sports, living in the city amongst the population, all of whom are going to be somewhat intermingling throughout this throughout these next couple of weeks. It's, it's a completely different situation. Trying to run it like the NBA bubble was a ridiculous attempt from the onset. So with that, uh, I'll jump into the headlines, but I'm gonna jump around just a little bit because okay. uh, talking about sports, the NFL coming out with the stern warning to the teams. Your COVID-19 outbreaks among unvaccinated players could lead to forfeited games. So the NFL has added an additional COVID-19 vaccination incentive for players, threatening forfeits and the loss of game checks if an outbreak among unvaccinated players causes an unresolvable disruption in the regular season schedule. So uh, Commissioner Roger Goodell uh, informed the clubs of the new policy Thursday. The league has encouraged vaccination for players, but has not required it per an agreement with the NFL Players Association. Unvaccinated players will be subject to severe protocols during training camp and the regular season, including daily testing, mask wearing and travel restrictions. Thursday's memo made it clear that unvaccinated players could, in theory, be responsible for the losses of games and paychecks as well. So the new policy drills down on a scenario that never occurred in 2020 when the NFL postponed five games and moved 10 others to accommodate outbreaks. A forfeit will be called in 2021 if, they, if a series of circumstances occur, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but... If a forfeit does occur, players from both teams are going to lose their game checks, and the team that suffered the outbreak would be responsible for any shortfall in the league's revenue sharing pool. Ouch. Yeah. Hit him in the pocketbook. Yeah, I mean, this is the NFL's reaction to a number of players. Most notably would be Buffalo Bills wide receiver Cole Beasley being vehemently against vaccination and, and frankly spreading misinformation about it because he he is <coughs> apprehensive himself about getting vac vaccinated he made a very dumb statement recently saying that oh well convince you'd be able to convince me if you give me some stock in pfizer uh, and that was just an a, a ridiculous statement but this is a reaction to they can't require those vaccines because of an agreement, of course, with the Players Association, but they still need to be careful about this. And the one way to ensure that these teams and these players especially are taking the protocols that are in place seriously and maybe even, you know, providing them a little more incentive to consider vaccination or get more consultation on whether or not vaccination is best for themselves and their families is to say you could lose games, you could lose your paychecks, you don't want to be responsible for being that person in your locker room that causes the loss of paychecks and this could affect your season. We're not going to let it stop our games this time around because there is a simple solution in place, which is vaccination. So here I'm going to uh, push back a little bit here okay. because we're talking about uh, athletes mm -hmm. and their body and their performance. Sure is their paycheck, mm -hmm. is their livelihood. So why not back that up and say, if you have some type of reaction that uh, you know inhibits your playing ability, because we do know that there are side effects to these vaccines sure. and everyone reacts differently. And so for some of these players, from my understanding, some of the pushback is, well, I don't know how it's gonna react to my body, mm -hmm. and then I'm just out of a paycheck. So why not say if you have a side effect, we're going to go ahead and give you some type of compensation for that? I mean, in all honesty, and, and, and that's really something for the government as sure. well. Like you keep going out, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. Well, it's not safe for everyone. Uh, there are people that have had reactions to this and have died from it. And we, while extremely rare, if your body is your uh, livelihood, are you going to be willing to risk that? Yeah, and especially if you can't require the vaccine because of an agreement with the Players Association, then, then that's a reasonable middle ground to say, listen, we are not, we can't force you to get this vaccine. We can't mandate that you can't play without being vaccinated. But if you're apprehensive and you ultimately go through with this to do what's best for your team, what's best for the continuity of football games, then, then you know, should you be one of those rare occurrences of people that have severe, a severe reaction that causes you to lose 
labor because of that or should you be in a situation where you have to be away from your team for a little while because of those side effects you'll be covered through the through the nfl i think that's that's an interesting that that would be an interesting proposition to make that i think would incentivize more players more than you could be the reason that your team loses a game misses the playoffs by one game uh your teammates lose their paychecks and so on and so forth well no one wants to be that player no um and we saw some of these situations even in junior high and high school right here locally where uh, you know some of these kids were basically bullied after it was discovered that they had COVID and you know it 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 forced them to uh, give up some of their games so it's a tough spot to be in so with that too the concern about the safety is the main reason many Detroiters are not getting vaccinated so about half of adults living in the city of Detroit are not yet fully vaccinated against COVID-19 according to data just released from the University of Michigan they did a recent survey among Detroiters who have not received any doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, nearly 8 out of 10 cited concerns about the safety of the vaccine. A similar number of unvaccinated Detroiters, 78%, also reported that concerns about side effects were among the reasons they have not gotten vaccinated. So in general, unvaccinated Detroiters were far less likely to say they trust the government's ability to ensure the safety of the vaccine. That was about 51% than those who have already been vaccinated. When asked about the single main reason Detroiters have not been vaccinated, safety concerns were the most common. Uh, according to the uh, representative survey, sorry, let me mute my computer there, of Detroit households conducted by the U of M's Detroit Metro Area Communications, or Community Study, rather, concern about side effects was a slightly less important factor with 22% of respondents saying, it was the main reason. Uh, black, 19%. Latino, 16% of residents were more than twice as likely as white. 6% residents to report that they did not get a vaccine due to concerns about the effectiveness of the vaccine. Residents under 40 were also more likely than those between 40 and 64 to avoid getting the vaccine because they felt their risk of getting COVID-19 or getting seriously ill was extremely low. And also, uh, here's a little dig to the media. Uh, the U of M survey also asked respondents whom they trust for information about COVID-19. Among the unvaccinated Detroiters, news media were by far the least trusted sources for information on COVID-19. And only 10% of unvaccinated Detroiters said they placed high trust in the news media for this information. On the other hand, about one third of unvaccinated Detroiters reported that they trusted their something i cut up the article yeah they're doctors yeah they're doctors that's what it was uh so uh you know kind of a little dig to the media they just don't trust the media and so that's why it's so important to really try to get this vaccine to the doctors your primary care doctors like we talked to dr twill so many times because you have a relationship typically with your doctor and you trust them a little bit more and uh you know in a way i kind of find it odd that you needed a survey about this like right. this is no surprise um i don't know yeah I, I don't i don't think the survey really here told us a whole lot that you couldn't have put two and two together on yourself and, and in terms of who you should be consulting with with this yeah the first person you should be consulting about COVID-19 vaccinations if you have questions is a medical professional certainly your primary care doctor would be a great resource for that or or at least at the very least a great resource to point you to other resources that can get you accurate information on the COVID-19 vaccination and you know the, the distrust in the media Part of it is just the, the age that we're in, but another part of that is, is this, and this is a this is an argument that could go on for for uh, a long time, hours even, is that there's so much different media, so much fragmentation of quote unquote news media, for lack of a better term, particularly cable news, that's very opinionated, that's giving people so much different information so much misinformation in one form of another that it's causing a lot of confusion and concern so of course go talk to your doctor if you have questions about COVID-19 vaccinations or ask medical professionals in your local community through your county or through other medical professional offices I will say I know a lot of people that have not been vaccinated mm -hmm. and um, I, 
I kind of felt bullied into getting it. That's why I only did the J and J because I figured eh, it's only one in my system versus sure. <laughs> two. Uh, but also with that, um, it, you know, it, the government has not done a good job here. Yeah. And yeah. as someone who worked for the government, you're not always clear and transparent. Right. And you know what? Shame on you. You brought our community and our society. And you know what? At some point in time, they need to own up to their responsibility in this and start being transparent. And, you know, you even have doctors in science and it's all different and doesn't align, but just be open and transparent. So I think that's kind of led us uh, to the position that we are mm -hmm. in as well. Hey, um, uh, speaking about being open and transparent, uh, the nursing homes, uh, the Department of Justice says they're not going to be opening a probe into Michigan's nursing homes. U.S. Department of Justice says it's not opening a civil rights investigation into Michigan nursing homes after requesting information from the state last year amid intense scrutiny during the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, politics, which yeah, I don't know. Uh, in August, when former President Donald Trump's administration was still in office, the federal department requested data from Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer as it examined executive orders for nursing homes issued in some states led by Democrats. Department of Justice joins Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel in declining to probe the policies on which Republicans have focused attacks. While GOP lawmakers have pressed to uncover more information about how the orders impacted the virus spread among the vulnerable population, the lack of law enforcement inquiries hinders their efforts. So the Department of Justice request in August came amid the presidential campaign, escalated a long brewing fight over policies implemented by some governors on how to care for elderly individuals with the virus in nursing homes amid fears of hospitals being overrun. You know, this has really been uh, sad because, uh, you know, according to state data, about 29% um, of the statewide virus linked deaths occurred uh, either from residents or staff members of some of these long term care facilities. And that number, we do know, is widely under reported. And so we'll see where this goes next, because I have a feeling some of the um, Republicans are not going to give up. But uh, they in this is where politics mm -hmm. has been a disservice to our community. Um, but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we need some of these answers to make sure it doesn't happen again. We do. And, and certainly politics have played a big role in the onset of these requests for probes into the nursing home deaths. And it certainly played a role in the refusal at certain levels of government, whether it be the attorney general's office, whether it be the Department of Justice now under a Democratic uh, under Democratic oversight from the president of the United States and and, and their apprehension to look further into the nursing home deaths. The, the fact of the matter is we knew early on in the pandemic, and we've known increasingly over the course of the pandemic as we've got new information that's come in and new investigations have gone on independently through journalists in our local area, such as Charlie LaDuff, that there's been mismanagement here and that we need to, at the very least, look into the, look into the mismanagement of the nursing homes and why so many deaths occurred in those nursing homes and what could have been done better so that if nothing else, in the future, we know what to do better and we have answers for the families of these people that were affected by this as to what went wrong and what we're going to do going forward to prevent stuff like this for, from ever happening again. Uh, as a reminder, you can always get a look at the latest headlines. Go to civiccentertv.com, click on coronavirus, and there we post them each and every morning. Uh, we are going to take a break here on the Megacast. When we get back, a lot to get to on this Friday edition of the show. We'll be talking about literacy for kids right after the break. That's coming up here next. And then coming up at uh, 1140, Great Lakes Pot Pies. The uh, owner is going to be with us. We'll talk to her about uh, how her business is doing in the middle of the pandemic. That's all next here on the Megacast. How you can support LGBTQ youth who may be at risk. It's simple. Just show them that you care. C-A-R-E. Connect. If you noticed any warning signs of suicide from someone you know, reach out to them. Ask. Ask directly. Are you thinking about killing yourself? It might be challenging, but talking about suicide is proven to reduce risk. Respond. If they open up to you about their suicidal ideation, honor that trust by responding with compassion and empathy. Empower. 
Talking openly is a great first step, but now you can empower them with the information and the support they need to improve their situation. Learn more about how you can show them you care and help prevent LGBTQ youth suicide. Visit trvr.org slash care. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. Great to have you back with us here on the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studio alongside Tyler Keith. And you know, uh, throughout the pandemic, we've talked about a lot about uh, kids and their education and, uh, you know, the possibility of how much of the pandemic may set them back and learning, but also reading. And um, I found this next little tidbit interesting. Uh, children who read for 20 minutes a day are exposed to 1.8 million words a year. That is fascinating. And it's important too because that that contributes greatly to them building their vocabulary, building their communication skills, and being able to, t- to tell stories and be more creative as well. So I mean, that's, that reading can go a long way, especially earlier on in their childhood. There's an organization here locally that's uh, really focused on trying to get kids reading. With that, let's bring in uh, Heather Mertz and J- uh, Jane Rose Valley. They are the founders of Literacy for Kids. Great to have you both with us. How are you today? Very well. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. We appreciate your time, but also the work that you're doing. And uh, Jane, if we can talk to you, what exactly is Literacy for Kids? Literacy for for Kids was born out of, I'm an author and I travel to schools across the country reading to them. And what Heather and I have learned is being in person, making that eye to eye contact, um, listening. There's more to literacy than just reading and writing. So we can't really redefine literacy. However, we like to kind of expand on it. We think that it also includes communication. So, listening, like I mentioned. Um, how they articulate their voice. Um, some kids can't just read, so we use illustrations. So we, we have this tagline that we like to put the art in literacy. And what we mean by that is um, we just broaden it and kind of include it in that way. So Heather, if I can ask you as the executive director, we do have so many programs, especially in the city of Detroit, focused on literacy for kids. What makes this organization different? Literacy for Kids stands out differently because we are introducing the concept that reading is connected to the arts for these students. And it really resonates with these students that are struggling who are behind with reading levels because we do add that artistic and creative element to literacy. Um, We offer event-based literacy programs and presentations and we bring them directly to these Detroit students. Um, These experiences focus on making a personal connection with these kids, which we have found impacts long lasting results. It helps build relationship and rapport with these students. We really highlight curiosity and imagination, um, which Jane and I believe is paramount to long-term learning. We just finished up some storytelling workshops and um, all children are storytellers and to try to get them to believe that and be able to tell their stories through different mediums, it was amazing and it was great to be back in their presence one-on-one. The masks are tricky but, um, but necessary. 
but it, it was great to be in front of them again. And um, it's, it's important for them as well. But when they learn that they don't just have to be able to, because writing and reading adds another layer of communicating. So if we can get through that, they can also communicate through different art mediums. Yes, through storytell earth through songs. Um, beat and rhythm. Um, it, it was just, it was great. We had a, a great time. We had two a great weeks. time. It was really nice. This is the first time since the pandemic that we were in front of these children again. And it was just, it was so amazing. It's what Jane and I needed mm -hmm. um, to just kind of bring that literacy based event program to the students directly. Uh, and seeing the results was incredible. We spent two weeks, uh, we partnered with Center for Success, and we spent two weeks with these students. And by the end of our workshop, they were writing and uh, illustrating their own books. So they found their voice and yeah, which, it, was it was amazing. Great. So what age group are we talking about here? We uh, work with a variety of age group for this particular workshop with Center for Success. It was ages seven through 10. Uh, through 12 maybe, uh, we're partnering, partnering with Detroit PAL uh, the first week of August, and that will be probably about the same age range. We love and Detroit we, PAL. We do too, we can't wait to work with the students. Yep. So uh, Gina, if I can ask you, because someone who's an author, we know that the medium has changed so much since we were kids because the students now, they have all these electronic devices in front of them. Sometimes, uh, you know, some of these kids aren't exposed to like actual old school books. How do you bridge the gap between the old, I don't want to say old school because then I feel old, <laughs> but let's just say, you know, in the new, new era of literacy, which so much of it is online. We still buy a book for like our authors in Detroit program. We're partnering with Detroit Public Schools and we still buy a book and donate it to each child. So we still believe strongly that having a book in front of them is important. And I think kids like that as well. Um, many of the authors in today's world though, are providing, especially through the pandemic, we're reading on a weekly basis and reading their books. Mac Barnett, who we um, collaborate with from California, would do a Saturday read along for children. So that's when you know authors are reading their own works. And I think that's kind of cool too. Um, we have this funny thing that we uh, tell the kids is that Jane and I happen to love the smell of a book. And if you say that to a student or a child, they laugh, but then they kind of get it. That holding and feeling a book and turning the pages and looking at the illustrations, it makes a difference. And it's part of our personal connection, which we have found has made those lasting results with students. So, I understand it. I get it. Yeah, <laughs> smell it. You like to smell books? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it sounds so weird, but there is, I, I remember, uh, you know, getting the, at first I started out, I think, on a Kindle and then the iPad. And it was like you didn't get to turn the pages. Right. So then they, uh, at least on the iPad, they, they added that little swipe with the sound of a page uh, turning. But I will say, since my iPad has died, I've had to go down into my basement and I'll go to like a lot of these book sales where the last day it's like five dollars you know get as many as you can and then I buy a bunch and then I, I give them to homeless shelters and stuff but it's been like oh I didn't read that one. Oh, I didn't read that one so like during COVID that's been this whole new exploration because as much as we like to think our electronic devices can fill a gap and they are great when you go on vacation you don't have to carry two or three big huge books with you right. nothing replaces the pages of a book and I, I feel like that feeling starts at a young age. And so Jane and I are working towards getting as many books in as many students' hands. And donations help do that. All, all donations directly fund our programs. Uh, you can go to our website, literacyforkids.org, and make a donation right to our website. And $10, $20 buys a book for one student. And that's we, kind of our goal. And we get the authors to personally sign them for each student. Um, and then they get that presentation from that particular author. So they kind of build this relationship, this kinship between that author and the book that they will have, it's kind of a memento that lasts, makes that 
relationship lasts a little longer. Mm -hmm. So Jane, can, can I ask you, coming from the standpoint of an author, what has this been like for you to take on this journey? Well, it just kind of happened so naturally in that I would go to these classrooms and see what a difference it makes mm -hmm. with these students. And I thought, if I'm making this difference, and it was so obvious to me, I thought if I can bring more authors and all authors feel like I do, we do it because we love children and, mm -hmm. and you know, sh that sharing. Um, if I can do this, then a larger group of people can do even more. And so Heather came on board and it's been amazing. It really has. It's the most rewarding, uh, fulfilling, uh, opportunity for both of us and all my book sales go directly for literacy for kids um typically at any children's author will know you don't get in it to it to 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 make money um but any money that is made goes directly into the literacy for kids that's how much i believe in what we're doing so i know that you guys um formed this group uh, in 2019 just before the pandemic so yeah. what has it been like to try to get uh, this organization uh, up and running, but then we're hit by COVID-19 and everything kind of shuts down for a while. You know, we really found the silver lining in the pandemic early on. We were able to pull authors from LA, from Brooklyn, from New York, from all over. Michigan. And as well as Michigan, Kenneth Craigle is from Grand Rapids. We were able to um, build this relationship with these authors that we might not have been able to afford to do so young in our formation because we were able to do it virtually. So Mac Barnett's in LA, uh, Katie Yamasaki is in uh, Brooklyn, and we were able to get these presentations, order the books, and still form our Authors in Detroit program, which we will launch uh, in fall 2021, partnering with the Detroit Public School System. So they videotaped their presentations. Um, so we missed that one-on-one -on -one with the kids and, and, and the authors, but it still allowed us to virtually forward. so we just tried to create a, a different way to do it we're talking with uh, jane rose valley and heather mertz founders for literacy for kids we also know though uh, while you found the silver lining at the end of the day you also need those relationships and the funding what has that side of the house been like during the pandemic hard to have yeah. a fundraiser i know some organizations have tried to do virtual eh. We're, we're always out uh, looking for uh, grants, looking for corporate sponsorships, uh, looking for donations. Uh, we did a big media launch with a plea for donations. Um, we hope to get a fundraiser in this year. So now that things are kind of getting back to normal-ish, we hope that the funds will start coming in a little more freely. It's been difficult though. So Jane, uh, can I ask you too, as someone who writes books, uh, what keeps that creative juice flowing and how do you keep thinking like a kid? Well, that thinking like a kid comes kind of naturally. I'm it not really sure. Does. I'm not sure Hashtag how. never grow up. <laughs> yes. um, my imagination, it's my favorite word and it's, it's kind of huge. So I started this Dinosaurs Living in My Hair series, and it was a poem I wrote for my daughter. She's got this crazy curly hair, and I used to say there could be dinosaurs living in there. And so that started, and, and, and I grew up with nursery rhymes, and so I always believed that a lesson and a moral of the story kind of needs to weave in there. So um, I'm not sure I answered your question because I get distracted. My mind goes crazy. There's but, her imagination at work. Yeah, right, that's right. great. So the third book's coming out. Um, I spend a lot of time in the Florida Keys and the ocean is a big importance to me. So the third book talks about environmental issues and keeping our oceans clean, teaching kids about picking up trash and what it does to the reef fish and the coral reefs. So I'm always thinking and uh, I drive Heather a little bit crazy, probably. <laughs> well, it was really fun because the third book is uh, at the printer currently. It is. And we were able to share the third book just with the, you know, the computer file, the digital file with the kids yesterday at Center for Success. And it was just 
so fun to share this book with these children in person for the first time and see their eyes light up. And it's just so rewarding. I, I can't I can't say it enough. It's just amazing to be in the presence of children. So with that, uh, just another minute or two, can you guys uh, tell us where can people get more information about your organization? Or maybe if um, for people who maybe don't have the money to donate, if is there a way for them to partner or to volunteer with your organization? Of course, visit us at literacyforkids.org is our website and all of our information's there, our contact information. Uh, we send out a newsletter uh, throughout the year, a few times a year. Um, so we inform people that way of our fundraising and uh, partnerships that are happening. Programs. Um, you can follow us on social media. Uh, we're Literacy for Kids Inc. Uh, that is our Twitter handle, um, social media, Instagram, Facebook, and all of our contact information is is in all of those areas. Well, it's been such a pleasure speaking with the two of you, and uh, thank you for your time and your commitment uh, to all of the kids here, uh, not only in the state of Michigan, but across uh, the country as well, because as an avid reader, I am Nancy Drew, by the way. Nancy Drew yeah. doesn't know it, but I'm Nancy Drew. People may not know it, but there were several yes. writers of Nancy Drew, but <laughs> but she, uh, Nancy Drew started my love of reading. So, uh, you know, it just it's one character, one book at a time. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. It's been great having uh, both of you again. Uh, Literacy for Kids. Go to their website. Find out a little bit more about uh, all the good things that they're doing to try to engage the next generation in the love of books because it can put them on a new path in life. So with that, we'll take a break here on the Mega Cast. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite things to eat, and that's pot pies. That's next here on the Mega Cast. <laughs> One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more, drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. Here's one more reason to get the COVID-19 vaccine. It's your shot to win. Anyone 18 years or older in Michigan vaccinated between December 1st, 2020 and July 30th, 2021 is now eligible to win millions in cash prizes, including million dollar jackpots and $50,000 daily prizes and vaccinated students could win thousands in college scholarships. For eligibility details and to enter, go to mishottowin.com. Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's organ donor registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. Thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us here on the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios alongside the one, the only, Mr. Tyler Keith. And just so you know, we are here Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon live. But there are so many other uh, avenues for you to be able to watch this show. You can always go to civiccentertv.com, click on Megacast, and there we post all of the previous episodes or go to the On Demand section and you can find the individual interviews because more than a year and a half into the show, 
and we've had some fascinating people uh, take time out of their schedule to join us on the show, but then also keep in mind, we're public access, so we replay this show quite often. Right. Uh, you'll find us Channel 15 on Comcast, 989 on AT&T, uh, and then also you can listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. Uh, Tyler, throughout the pandemic, I think uh, some people were like, oh, uh, so many people are working remote, so they have more time for cooking and this, that, and the other. But really, it, schedules are a little bit more frazzled than ever. And so uh, trying to get a great home-cooked meal that you can stick in the freezer but then throw in the oven yeah. and feel good about what you're serving your family can be a challenge. So one local lady has found a way to kind of close that gap. Uh, Jane Tietelbaum joins us now on the Mega Cash. She's the owner for Great Lakes Pot Pies and Clawson. It's so fun to have you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. How'd you come up with this business model? Uh, well, I wanted to start a food business, so I started making healthy bars and that kind of thing. And then people said, no, we need dinner. So I started coming up with ideas for meals, and I started making pot pies. And when you say making pot pies, these are from scratch, right? Yes, I started with the chicken pot pie, and I was making the big size, and then I went to the personal size, but then people would say, oh, I'm vegetarian, oh, I need gluten-free, oh, do you have meatball, meat, beef stew, or anything meat, and so anyway, I started coming up with some more varieties, and here I am. That is really amazing, because I will say, if you want to talk about comfort food, there is nothing better than a pot pie. And I love that you're doing this um, organically, too, for the need of the community, because uh, I will say, um, you know, a lot of times I would go to Costco and get their pot pie, but there's two people in our family. That thing weighs like 20 pounds, and <laughs> we'll be eating it for the next, you know, week, and then we end up throwing out half of it. And so to be able to get them in the smaller size but the individual ones as well. What made mm -hmm. you come up with that design? Just people saying, I only, I'm only, i only one in a family? Yeah, exactly. And as a child, I like pot pie so much, and I always ate the little individual one, and I think some people like to have their own. Uh, so uh, I will say, uh, Janie, I attempted to make my own pot pie after Thanksgiving with the leftovers. It may or may not have turned out so well. So what's the secret? To the crust because i feel like uh, the crust yeah. is really the the golden uh, shining thing that needs to be right to make a pot pie good right well i can tell you when i started this business so many people told me you're not going to be able to make the crust it's really <laughs> hard but i just worked on it worked and worked and got it to come out right and i've made it so many times already that it I, it just works. It's a good recipe. So do you have a secret? Um, well, we use palm shortening. We don't use lard, and there is butter in it. So with the mixture of all that and then the special seasonings, all of our doughs are seasoned. Oh, that's a secret right there. Yeah, and also our pies are cooked from frozen, and when the butter is really cold, it makes the dough come out really good. So when you were trying to design this, what was the process like? Because you, just the little thing that you mentioned right right there about going from frozen to then cooking it, or baking it rather, uh, and trying to make it feel like it just came out of the oven. Right, so I worked really, really hard on the filling. One of the things with the filling is if you're eating the big pot pie, when you cut into it, you didn't want it to implode and be just a mess. So I worked hard at making the consistency thick, and we finally got it down, and it just it just works all together, and they really do come out great if it's cooked from frozen. Some people try to defrost them, and they still come out fine, but the crust comes out the best when it's from, cooked from frozen. See, I would never think to do that, so it's so great to have. I, I wish I knew you way back when, because I would have been your taste tester. Oh, that would have been fun. <laughs> Did your family get sick of uh, pot pies, though? No, never. <laughs> no. They love when I bring them home. 
So, again, we're talking with uh, Janie Tietelbaum. She's the owner of the Great Lakes Pot Pies in Clawson, and it has been raved about since you opened, but you haven't been open that long, and you did this, this you know, venture in the middle of a pandemic. What's it been like for you? All right. It was a little tough. We've been at the Royal Oak Farmer's Market since November of 2018 and got so busy there that we decided to open the store, and then with signing the lease and everything, we had to open up last April. So we've only been here a little over a year and people just started to know we were here. And because of the pandemic, they everybody wanted frozen food. So it just worked out really well for us. So what's it like, I will say, I do think I remember you being at uh, the farmer's market. I purchased a few things from you uh, way back when, but what was it like to do that a leap of faith to take it from the farmer's market into a storefront because, you know, there were a lot of steps and then the pandemic happened. Um, it was a little tough, but I knew I would have my sales from the farmer's market every week because we, I'm still doing it. So even if nobody came to the store, I know I would still be at the farmer's market every week. And that really pulled me through. And then we kept telling people we were here. Our sign was out on the street and then people got to know we were here. So, so it turned out okay. With that, Janie, I have to ask, I know that you pride yourself on being all natural and mm -hmm. really a home cooked meal that uh, I always like to say when people come over, oh, I cooked it. Someone else just yeah. helped me with it, but I put it in the oven. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, look, you have to make sure you don't burn it, Tyler. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but Janie, if I can ask you, uh, what's it been like um, on the supply side of things, being able to get the ingredients, but also the employees. Mm -hmm. Okay, the employees, I've been really lucky. I have a great group here and I'm fully staffed, no complaints there, but I know it's been tough out there for some people, especially in the restaurant industry. Uh, supply wise, once in a while we've had trouble, but I'm small enough that I can run to the grocery store and I can figure it out. So what is uh, your most popular? Is it the, oh, chicken, the pot chicken pie? Oh, yeah. What is it about oh, chicken yeah. pot pie that everyone just loves? Um, I think it's what you grew up on. And back then we only had, to, it was only chicken. You know, now we have other varieties, but everybody comes in to try the chicken first and then they'll try some of the other, but most of them come in to try the chicken. I, I, how popular is the gluten-free? Because I feel like, um, especially when you're hosting like a brunch or something uh, before like i will say uh, janie maybe i'm not that good of a host but a few years ago i wouldn't think to ask anyone oh do you have food allergies do you mm -hmm. need this do you need that but now my nephew he's gluten intolerant so i always have to have something gluten free so now you have to start asking but it seems like it's become more common that people are gluten free so is that a popular item for people to buy from you Yes, we have a lot of customers, and we probably sell and people come in and say, I didn't get some, you know, a lot of gluten-free people get sick very easily from food that they eat. So we have a huge gluten-free following. Yeah, because I will say once people find out, you, it, it's like the pizza. You know, I think Just Pizza has gluten-free. Mm -hmm. Once they find out, they're lining up. Again, we're talking with uh, Janie Tietelbaum. She's the owner of the Great Lakes Pot Pies and Clawson. And uh, Janie, what are some of your other favorite pot pies? And how do you come up with new recipes and keep it interesting? Okay, so we have Italian meatball that's like eating a calzone. It's meatballs and sauce and mozzarella cheese all melted on top and the crust has basil, oregano and garlic in it. We've got a delicious beef stew. We have uh, we've got three the Italian chicken and vegetarian. We've got a vegan. We have something for everybody. We have hand pies that are kind of like the old fashioned hot pocket size and then our personal size and then the large. And then we also do this thing called the naked where you can just buy the filling. Oh. Hmm. And everything comes frozen. The, uh, the hand pies you can put in the microwave. They're the only thing that's pre-cooked that you can put in the microwave, but they're much better in the oven. So how much uh, time does it take to bake some of these? Uh, it's about an hour for the pies. 55 minutes depends on your oven. Very easy. 
Right from the freezer to the oven. So enough time for it to uh, make your house smell really, really good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we have a couple of dessert pies now. We have a chocolate pecan and we have an apple pie that the dough is raw. So you cook it at home. So your house smells like apple pie. So, Janie, can I ask, are you offended if someone mm -hmm. tries to pass off your pies as homemade? Not at all, as long as they keep coming in and buying them. <laughs> That's totally something I would do, Tyler. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good strategy. You know, get, impress people. Come, have them come back for more. Right, right. It, it, it makes the house smell so good when you, especially mm -hmm. like baking an apple pie. Oh, my gosh, it smells so amazing in the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with that, too, Janie, I, I know that you're constantly coming up with these new recipes. Anything you're working mm -hmm. on that may be a bit unusual? Um, well, we just had a chili pot pie that we did just for a short time. And really? it was a big, yeah, it was a really big hit. It was um, beef chili. Uh, it's probably going to go on the menu full time because so many people really liked it. So we have a few in the works. We have a special holiday pie coming out, or Thanksgiving in a pie that's officially going on sale in September. But if somebody's listening and they want to come in and get one, we have some available now. It's uh, it's Thanksgiving in a pie. It's a layer of stuffing, uh, sweet potatoes, some cranberries, turkey filling, and it has a cornmeal crust. And we cut out leaves on the top with some cranberries. It's really beautiful. So with that, uh, Janie, looking ahead, uh, how has it been in the summer months? Because we know typically a pot pie is more of a fall winter food. All right. It's a little slower now, but just still plenty of people are coming in. It's dinner. So it's easy. They have it in the freezer and they just take it out and make it. And so we're still selling a lot now, but it is definitely slower. Uh, but I could see that, right? Like if you're a parent and the summer months, mm -hmm. your kids are running around, you throw something in. It, it can be challenging to come up with dinner every month. I know I'm um, always asking my husband, what do you want for dinner? <gasps> the question yeah. again. So, uh, hey, uh, Janie, can I ask, do you need any uh, taste testers? I'm not far away. I'm in Kiko Harbor. I'll, I'll drive you can over. can always, always <laughs> come in. We'll have something for you to eat. <laughs> So is it hard to come up with some of the new recipes, though, for a pot pie? Um, not really. We have a list. And uh, we're just trying to keep up with what we have right now. But I do have a list of some new ones that I want to come out with. So I know that you started this um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, is, at least for your storefront. Any silver linings or any advice that you would give to other people thinking about following in your path? Um, you got to just go for it. You got to try. But, you know, by starting at the farmer's market gave me a good head start. So I wasn't coming in here with no background. I had some history and it made a big difference for me. So with the farmer's market, um, because we know that during the pandemic, people have started to pay a little bit more attention to where their food is coming from. Has it had a benefit for you knowing that what you're offering is is pure and healthy? Yeah, I, we try we try to get local and organic when we can, but when we can't, you know, we do the best we can, but it has been a little challenging lately, but we use less butter than we have to. We use less sodium and you know salt than we have to. Um, we don't want somebody to come in and say, I had your pot pie last night. I was up all night drinking water. We don't, we never hear that. So with that, uh, again, uh, Janie Tietelbaum with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the owner for the Great Lakes Pot Pies in Clawson. And I know you mentioned uh, the apple pot pie. Any other desserts that you offer? Mm -hmm. uh, we've got, besides the chocolate pecan pie also, we have cookies. We have three varieties of cookies. And one is gluten-free chocolate chip that are really good. You wouldn't even know they're gluten-free. And we make pie chips. We make them in three flavors, the everything seasoning, sea salt and thyme and cinnamon sugar. So the pie chips, is that just left over from the, the pies or, or uh, like the crust? Well, we just make them. There's never, <laughs> we don't have anything left over these so days. Uh, we just make them. They're really fun, They're like little chips. Well, it's been so fun having you uh, on the show and we uh, wish you continued success. And, and anything maybe yeah. I didn't ask that you want to add before we say goodbye, um, Janie? 
Well, we ship all over the country. Um, we have a website. It's greatlakepotpies.com. And you can come in the store. We're here in Clawson. We're closed on Sundays, but we're open every other day. Or you can come to the Royal Oak Farmer's Market. And we're in Farmington also right now. We're their farmer's market until the end of October. So can I ask you, because I'm about to do a brunch on Sunday, do you have any brunch uh -huh. pot pies? <laughs> uh, we... Have a, we have a quiche, but there's, it's only available on hand pies. But we have a lot of people who will serve our chicken pot pie for brunch because it's brunch. And... See, maybe that's something you add on your menu as well. Yeah. For yeah. Well, you know, we used the to, cooking challenge, we used like to me. Have, that would be nice. But we used to have a big quiche, but um, it was a little challenging for customers to cook ours. So now we only offer it in hand pie. Got you. Pies. But it's really good. Broccoli and cheese. Well, Janie, it's been so fun having you. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Again, Great Lakes Pot Pies, they're located in Clawson. So if you're looking for a quick dinner, but it's always good to buy some of these and put them in your freezer. And then when you can't decide what to have for dinner, instead of having cereal, pop in a healthy pot pie. Hey, we're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back uh, in the 11 o'clock hour, a lot to get to, uh, including talking sports. Uh, the Lions, mm -hmm. are you ready for some football? You're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. This is the Megacast. How does marijuana affect the team brain? Our brains are still developing into our 20s. With regular use, marijuana can affect team brain development. It can affect our brain's circuitry and blood flow and impair thinking, learning, and memory function. Which could hold us back from reaching our potential. Don't let marijuana mess with your brain. Get the facts at michigan.gov slash drug free. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MICAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash MICAL. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. And if there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never would just want to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves. And all I had to do was be there.
Great to have you with us here on the MegaCast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios with the one, the only, Mr. Tyler Keith. Oh, As a reminder, we're always here Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon. Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. You can catch us Channel 15 if you have Comcast 99 on AT&T. If you're out driving around in your car, doesn't have to be a smart car no, like mine. Uh, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. And then, of course, we also uh, stream the show on our Facebook page. Tyler. Yes. You're the sports crazy nut around here. And, and generally a nut also. Yeah. Are you ready for some football? I'm, I'm ready for a lot of, I'm ready for a lot of the future of Detroit sports. It's, we're, we're, we're starting to see a little bit of sunlight coming through the clouds. So it's a good time. I will say uh, miracles do happen when the Tigers are the hottest baseball team oh, happening boy. right now. Yeah, yeah, they're they're playing good. They're playing good ball lately, and uh, you know that's another team that it's been a little bit more of a surprise with their success lately. Because but they're a well-coached team, well-managed team with AJ Hinch, and they got a, a good young core of players there. So with that, the only thing I care about sports is the tailgate, yes. the party. Other than that, I don't really care. So with that, I'll turn the interview over to Tyler with our next two fascinating guests. Yes, yes, coming on to, to join us today and talk about all things Detroit sports. We got a lot going on in the world of Detroit sports right now. We're joined by Matt Derry, host of the Locked On Lions podcast and, and longtime Detroit sports radio host, as well as Woody Woodruff from Fox 2 Sports. Woody, Matt, thank you for being with us today. No problem, Tyler. Good to see What's you. What's going on? Yeah, good to How's see you. How's everybody doing? What's up, Woody? How you doing, Matt? You, you're on dog duty today at home? Yeah, I, I got a I got a big beast here, man. And uh, <laughs> quiet, quiet now, quiet now, bro. Yes, dog days of this summer, is, definitely. Ro oh, Ronnie, man. Ronnie's like, thank goodness I'm not home. <laughs> <laughs> Trixie, so Matt, just so you know, like he could put Trixie in her apartment, which is what we call her crate, and she yeah. give her a snack, and she'd be quiet. <laughs> He's just parking there. She's got a lot to say. Oh my gosh! And you know what? Trixie is, a, Trixie is a huge Lions fan, and yes. she is excited about this year. You know what, Matt? The one thing I was thinking about before we uh, even started this was, I'm looking at this Lions team, and you know what? Okay, the players are there. We can go through all of that. But you know what? The coaching staff is something that really has to be taken a look at because all of these guys, to a man has experience in the league, has won in the league. And so I got to think that they have those little insights and everything else that those players can easily absorb. So that may make this iteration of Lions team maybe that much better. Yeah, you know what? I think you bring up a great point, and, and I know Tyler was going to get to it as well. Like training camp next week, and what have we, what have we heard over the last few years when it's training camp, mini camp, or even the lead up, it's always the same thing, right? Certain players are unhappy. People don't like the schedule. This and that. All of these guys are so excited to get to work and work with this crew and this staff, which is, I've never seen a staff like this. It has so many former players on it, from Deuce Staley to Mark Brunel, uh, Aaron Glenn, Anthony Lynn played in the league. So, yeah, I mean, the roster, not good. All right. Vegas has them at five and five, you know, over under five wins. So they expect them to be a five and 12 football team. But if the staff can get the most out of guys like Tracy Walker, who have been a little bit of a disappointment, maybe Taylor Decker becomes a Pro Bowl left tackle because of the coaching. Guys step up. Jelani Tavai isn't a terrible football player. Maybe he goes from terrible to decent. That, then then we have something here. Um, and and I, I'm with you totally. I think that that's, that's probably the selling point right now is that this crew of coaches might – take a little bit of this water and turn it into some wine in the next few years, I'll be right there. Yeah, and especially and because it's a matter of leadership also. You, you, uh, we knew for sure in the la last coaching administration with Matt Patricia and that a lot of the players did not see it. Most of the players really did not see eye to eye with him and with his assistants. And you got Dan Campbell coming in, who's the kind of guy that players are willing to run through a brick wall for. And these guys that have experience as players in the league, but are also well-established and respected coaches. You mentioned guys like Aaron Glenn and Deuce Staley, who have already been coaching for teams that have had relative success in recent years as, as well. And with, the, and with that being the case, 
oftentimes when you have a coaching change, that transition takes some time and it isn't, and it's very rough even going through training camp and into the early weeks of the season. And especially with a roster like the Lions that has this youth that hasn't had much success, if any, in the last several years under the previous coaching staff, that transition can be really rough. Do you think the situation with the staff that they have coming in right now and with the way that the players respect those guys, that that's going to have an impact on, on increasing the development of these players and maybe moving this along a little quicker than fans maybe would have expected previously? I don't know. I, I think that um, I still think this is going to be a tough year. Uh, yeah. And Woody will probably back oh, yeah. me up on this. The schedule's murder. It's just difficult. Mm -hmm. And if Aaron Rodgers comes back and plays for the Packers, it makes it even more difficult. They're playing the NFC West, which is loaded, and they're playing the AFC North, which is loaded. All right, the one gimme everybody thinks is Cincinnati. But I tell you what, Joe Burrow and that, and that, and that core of receivers, they're not going to be a, a, that's not going to be a layup. So I think the schedule's difficult, but you're right. I think that now the, the culture, uh, the, the experience that some of the coaches have here, we'll see if Dan Campbell can coach. I don't know if he can, but at least he, he, he was not one of these first year coaches that came in and said, I'm going to put my system and my guys in here. He went out and got really good people, some he didn't know. And he doesn't have a system. He'll, he'll figure out the system with what he has. And I, I, I like that. Plus, he's going to have a lot of help, Matt. I mean, he's got uh, guys like Anthony Lynn who have been head coaches before. I right. mean, you know, he has that experience to draw on. And you know what? As the previous regime, maybe the smartest guy in the room wanted to be the head coach. It seems that the smartest guy in the room could be Dan Campbell because of who he surrounded himself with. I mean, you know, all of those voices may turn out to be the thing that you know brings this team out of the darkness you know what i'm saying i mean if yep. they can uh you know just a solid footing to start to move this thing forward we could see serious results here in a short amount of time we're Wouldn't joined by nice? yeah we're joined by matt Derry, who hosted the locked on lions podcast and woody woodruff from Fox 2 Sports here on the Oakland County Megacast talking about a lot in Detroit sports that's going on right now and it's draft season and coming up uh, beginning tonight is the NHL draft and just earlier on this week General Manager Steve Eisman made a made an interesting move in a, in a trade with the Carolina Hurricanes, acquiring a, a quality young goaltender, 25 year a 25 year old goaltender from the uh, from the Hurricanes, and the the Red Wings, of course, picking sixth overall in the, the draft. What who can we expect to be some of the names that may be coming across for the Detroit Red Wings? And what is Steve Eisman's goal looking in this draft? What really does the, do the Lions need to come out of this draft with some success? You know what? I'll I'll start with that, Tyler, because uh, we listened to Steve Eiserman yesterday on his uh, conference call with the media, and uh, at number six uh, overall in the draft, uh, Steve uh, seems to be uh, as up in the air as everybody else. Uh, you know, this deal that he got for the goalie Alex uh, uh, Nedeljkovic uh, from Carolina. Um, nice work, Woody. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> uh, this this kid uh, really comes over for free because of all of the uh, draft picks that they had. And so to deal Jonathan Bernier, who really didn't want to come back anyway, okay, and a late third round pick for a 26 year old goalie who could be, you know, uh, to pair him up with Thomas Grice, who could be the, uh, you know, the, the tandem for a couple of years until you go, you know, develop your next goalie. Now that does mean that Iserman could pick a goalie at number six, and there are a couple at the top, but you know, right now, it's it's very hard to say because he, even he's up in the air. It could be it could be offense. It could be a goalie. Could be defenseman. I think it I think it's going to be goalie because he's going to stockpile it. But again, that's just me. Uh, I really don't know what the Red Wings are going to do. But they are in a good position because they have so many picks and so many options to go to and so many deals that could potentially be made that I'm not really worried about what Steve Eisman's going to do at number six overall. He's going to get a quality player. But I don't know if it really matters who that player is right now. Yeah, Nadalkovic drafted 37th overall by the Hurricanes in 2014 and the Calder Cup finalist last season with 15 yeah, wins in his 23 games yeah. uh, as a starter. That's so that's, big key, Tyler. I mean, yeah. you know, you get a kid who almost wins the Calder Cup. Right. That's, uh, you know, that's not uh, anything to sneeze at. I mean, the kid is uh, obviously playing at a high level. And if he can come here and continue that, that's exactly what the Red Wings would need. And they paid almost nothing for it. It's going to be a great deal. Yeah, Steve, really Steve Eisman. Steve Eisman tonight could draft Woody at number six, and the, and the fans will love it. All right, and I'm not. I'm not okay. saying Steve Eisman has done a bad job. I think Steve Eisman inherited a mess. 
<laughs> but it's 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 about time we start seeing some victories here. Um, yeah. I think the Iser plan so far has been average, but I think because he's Steve Eiserman and he's a legend in this town, everybody expects whatever he touches to turn to gold. I think come next season, some guys need to get better. You know, the Dylan Larkins of the world have got to get better. I trust Steve Eiserman absolutely, and you saw what he built in Tampa Bay. Uh, but I think no matter what they do tonight, I think the fans and, and, and a lot of Detroit media will be will be applauding it because it's Steve Eiserman. Yeah, but Matt, does it, isn't that isn't that the thing that gives him maybe a little more cachet? I mean, he has built it uh, somewhere else. You know what I yes. mean? He, he has. Uh, it's not like he's just coming here as you know a former Red Wings guy, and now he's in the big chair. And you know, what's he going to do? That kind of no, thing. So. But I'm just saying, Woody. I think that if this thing was off the, if this rebuild was off and running with somebody else, I think there would be a little bit more heat on somebody else. But I think because it's Steve Eiserman. I'm not saying he's getting a free pass. I do think the guy knows what he's doing, but I think that it's time to start winning. I'm 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 surprised the coach is back. Um, I know everybody likes him, but like time to start winning. I'm not saying they're going to win a cup next year. Right. But it is, you know, being bad for this long is surprising to me based on the history of this franchise and how many great people they've had here over the years. It's about looking at that pro uh, at the progress and seeing a, at least a step forward and there needs to be a significant step forward here in the near future and you want to see no guys like Dylan Larkin take it to that next level. On the other side uh, of Little Caesars Arena, one team that has taken it to, to the next level over, over the course of their previous season is the Detroit Pistons, who of course won the NBA draft lottery and will be selecting number one overall next week Thursday, or maybe they won't be. A lot of rumors fl flying out there that the Pistons are fielding calls for the number one overall pick. We know that every other team in this league would love to have a guy like Cade Cunningham, the presumptive number one overall pick, and the Houston Rockets are definitely uh, in tough pursuit of getting number one to try to get Cade Cunningham. Is this, I think this is all smoke and mirrors. It has to be in it. And especially <laughs> if you have a guy, if you have every team in the league that wants Cade Cunningham, there's no greater indication that that's the guy to take and you need a guard. Right. I, I'm, I, I agree. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, I think it'd be very silly and foolish to trade this thing. I don't yeah. think they're going to. You know, there's, you know, there's, you're right. It's silly season right now. Hey, maybe they can, you know, three-way deal with Cleveland and Philly. Colin Sexton yeah. can go to Philly. We can get Ben Simmons, the number three pick. No, 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 no. Don't, don't overthink this thing. And I don't think Troy Weaver will. No. If Cade's the guy and, and, the, and the crowd was chanting for him at Comerica Park the night when he was there, that's the guy you take. And then you can also market around him. What do you know? That, that, that building's been empty. The it last has, few years. It, it has know? been empty, Matt. And you know what? I agree with you. You can build around a guy like Cade Cunningham. Uh, I also like the fact that he said he wasn't making any other visits. He came to Detroit, yeah. and yeah. that was it. And you know what? And that tells me that at the top of this draft, there's a couple of guys, and then there's a big fall off. OK, let's not get caught in the fall off. Let's take the good guy at the top. And I think that's exactly what Troy Weaver is going to do. You don't get the first pick uh, in the in the NBA draft after how long, Matt? Almost like 51 years, something like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, we have the first pick. So you don't take that just to trade it and get more picks. No, this is what you wanted. You get the top pick and you have a guy who's head and shoulders above everybody else. So why not take him? This is a, I, I agree with Matt. This is a no brainer. And I think there's a lot of smoke right now around the Pistons and trade deals. And, you know, this, somebody this this GM's talking to this GM. I don't buy any of that. I don't believe any of it. In Troy, we trust here in Detroit. It has to That's be that. right. That's right. And Tyler, let's be honest. What just happened? Milwaukee won a championship because they had a superstar in Giannis mm -hmm. and then a bunch of other good pieces. A they didn't win based star. on, well, let's accumulate right. players. Let's let's trade down and get more guys like Ben Simmons and then Mobley. No, no, no. Ben Simmons is not a star. Right. He's not. Right. I know he's an all-star. The guy can't shoot. All right, Woody has better range, so I, I he, he does. You've so never seen I, him play. Oh boy, oh boy. Well, you've seen oh, Ben Lonnie Simmons Chinese. play. It's not much better. <laughs> but like, Cade could be that guy, and that's the guy you build around. And then the yeah. other guys, Sadiq Bay, Isaiah Stewart, are the complementary pieces built around the star. It's something we haven't had here since what? Woody Grant Hill. Exactly, and that's the whole point. I mean, if you want to build this thing into where you want it to get back to then you take the good players. This is your opportunity to do it the easiest way possible through the draft. 
You don't have to convince anybody to come here. The guy, the kid's going to be on a rookie contract, that kind of thing. So just take him, uh, milk him for what he's got, build this team into a winner, and move and keep going on from there. You add pieces as you go. Matt, you had a perfect example with the Bucks. Okay, they draft Giannis Antetokounmpo. Okay, and then they add the Chris Middleton piece. Unfortunately, it comes from the Pistons, but. They add the piece, and then the next thing you know, they keep building right around it, and they have a championship team. I, I love what they did in Milwaukee. Congratulations to the Bucks. Yeah. And what I love is he wants to be here, too. His reaction when the Pistons got the number one overall pick was excitement. It was, let's go. It's let's bring Detroit basketball back. And, you know, for fans, that's the first. That's one of the first things you want to see from a guy with that kind of talent. You know the talent's there. You know the potential's there. But people in, in the NBA aren't looking to play in Detroit. And so when you have that top-level talent coming out of the college ranks that says, I want to be here, that's huge. Yes, Ronnie. So really? if I can ask the two of you, because um, while I've enjoyed the sports chatter, I really have no clue what you're talking about. Um, oh, <laughs> again, <laughs> I'm about the tailgate. I'm just going to be honest. But here's the other important thing I think that's going to impact the upcoming NFL season. If I can get both of your thoughts of the latest news coming out regarding vaccinations for the players. So many of the players are saying, we don't want to get vaccinated. Now the NFL is saying, hey, you don't get vaccinated? It's going to cost you some money if we you have to forfeit a game. Your thoughts on that? Well, well I'll, okay. I'll start. Go, go. Oh, actually, Woody, go ahead. I'll, I'll start it off, Matt. Um, right now, those, uh, those rules by the NFL uh, look like they're playing a little bit of hardball here mm -hmm. with uh, everybody else. I mean, last year there were games that were postponed and moved and, you know, uh, everyone was accommodated. But this year the NFL is saying, hey, look, you're, we're not going to let anything interrupt our business model, including COVID-19. So if you're not on board, you better get on board. And they're making this now so that by the time, you know, players want to get uh, 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 vaccinated and fully immunized, they have the time to do that. So I would suggest that that players would go do it. But, you know, there are a few. I think the number is what 80 percent of the league has at least started vaccinations and like 75 percent of teams are, you know, uh, fully vaccinated. But there are penalties here. If you forfeit a game, I mean, you're going to have to lose a game check. You're going to have to add to the league revenue sharing pool, which is, you know, the team is going to have to pay money. No one's going to like this. So I, how tight is that bubble going to have to be, Matt, to keep everybody off this COVID-19 list? Well, you, you just said it. You said the key phrase there, Wood, and, and that is business. Roger Goodell and the owners are running a business. And last year, they got hit a little bit in the pocketbook, and they didn't, they didn't like that. And you're right, there were accommodations made for like the Ravens and the Steelers, but when the Lions all coaching staff had to coach, had to watch right. the game on television and exactly. like the interns running the team, they didn't care about us here in Detroit. It was, it was, it was ridiculous. But yeah, well, that being said, you've got players now publicly, DeAndre Hopkins, who's a star, Jalen Ramsey and others saying, they can't tell us what to do with our bodies. That's a tough, slippery slope here because you're right. If games are canceled, if there there are issues with too many players uh, contracting the the, the 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 disease and everything, and they can't play, they're not going to accommodate like they did a year ago because we have this we have this vaccine and we've been waiting for it. So, unfortunately, you know, I I think I hear what the players are saying, and yes, I respect any decision, but hey, how are we going to get out of this thing? Is is to get vaccinated, and I think that. Uh, you know, I, I think more uh, has to go into this besides just the, 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 the Goodells of the world dropping the hammer. Um, we'll see how it goes in training camp and how players like the guys that aren't vaccinated, they're, they're going to have different rules for coming into the facility. A lot of them are not going to like that, and they may end up getting vaccinated before the season starts. My, my big question is, what, would, what might the travel restrictions be, uh, you know, for players that you know are unvaccinated? Do they come in separately? How does that, how would, how would right, that even right. work? Because there's one, there's one airplane. Right. I don't, I don't know how you would, uh, you know, deal with that. That's why I'm saying, I mean, either keep the bubble tight or, you know, maybe you don't have to play football. I mean, I'm going to just come out and say it. The NFL private company, they can make their own rules. I mean, now, granted, there is, you know, a union issue with the players union and all that. But, you know, right now, the NFL is accommodating the players union by not mandating it. But they could easily say, hey, if you want to play in this league, everybody gets vaccinated easily.
So if I can yeah. jump in here for a second, would it be more comfortable? Because Tyler and I were talking at the top of the show at the end of the day for these players, their body is their paycheck. And if they do get vaccinated because it's mandated and they have side effects and can no longer play football or can't play it to the level of which they were, should they be compensated for it? Well, you know, uh, I honestly don't know. I, a, I would think I think there would be a deal. I think there would have to there would be something that would have to take place between the players association and the and the and, and the owners and the league before the season. I, I don't know the language of that, but that's actually a pretty good question, Ronnie. I don't it's a tough one because I think now most people that have been vaccinated are doing okay. There are going to be side effects for some. There would be there there's side effects and, and the actual disease for others that have not been vaccinated. And, and with, with with cases spiking in certain spots, and 97% of the cases, uh, and, and, and you know the folks that are contracting COVID are, are folks that are not vaccinated. So, a lot of different angles to this. I would not want to be Roger Goodell right now. I'm going to run this thing. Yeah, and you know you need to balance the need for continuity of football, but also this could easily turn into a situation that could be of a nightmare between the NFL office and the Players Association. We're joined by Matt Derry, the host of the Locked On Lions podcast, and Woody Woodruff from Fox yeah. 2 Sports. And we're just about to wrap up. We're running a little bit long on time. So before I let you guys go, what do you anything else from, from you today? Well, you know, you could always uh, get rid of uh, one of those crutches that uh, some of the anti-vax people are standing on by just make, having the government make this an approved uh, thing instead of an emergency mm -hmm. use thing just to prove it. And that way, you know, it would be a government approved deal and everybody could, uh, you know, go out and get it. Now, that's going to take some work to do. And I don't know if it's going to happen during this NFL season, but right. that is one option. And uh, let's just hope that the Lions can avoid any of those negatives that we talked about, like fines and forfeits and things like that and stay safe for the whole year. Diesel, your uh, thoughts I, on the Cleveland Indians before we let you go. Your thoughts on the Cleveland Indians franchise <laughs> changing their name to the Guardians, as was announced this week. <laughs> I, You know what? If people will do some research, obviously it came out this morning. My Twitter's blowing up. All my family's calling me. As an Indians fan, I'm fine with it. You know what I want? I want to win. Yeah. Like, I want to ring. I'm t <laughs> the name is, like, so secondary to me. Like, I just want to win. I got Tiger fans texting me. Oh, we're catching you in the standings. You know how embarrassing that is for an Indian fan? The Tigers <laughs> behind us. Screw the name. We better fend off that 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 outfit downtown. But Guardians, there is a significant historical significance. The big bridge that goes from the West Side Market to the stadium. There are these two giant Guardians of Transportation statues. It's a part of the history of this city. I'm fine with it. I was not for the word the name Spiders, which people wanted because that was the original name. So I'm fine with it. Well, we thank both of you for being with us today. Yeah, what, what, let's get your thought on it real quick before we get going. You know what? I, whatever those guys down in Cleveland want to do is fine with me, Matt. I just want to <laughs> see, see you with a, with a Guardian shirt on next instead of an Indian's shirt. <laughs> hey, I will be prepared for the next mega cast I'm invited to. No, no question. Attaboy. Marcus, Attaboy. Well, thank you guys for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Go Lions. Yep, go Lions, go Tigers, go Pistons, and, you know, in the garden, Gardens can be second place in the AL Central. We're going to take a quick break here, and when we come back, we'll speak with the new head of school at Oakland Early College. That coming up next here on the Oakland County Megacast. Here's one more reason to get the COVID-19 vaccine. It's your shot to win. Anyone 18 years or older in Michigan vaccinated between December 1st, 2020 and July 30th, 2021 is now eligible to win millions in cash prizes, including million dollar jackpots and $50,000 daily prizes. And vaccinated students could win thousands in college scholarships. For eligibility details and to enter, go to mishottowin.com.
recent interview with uh, Matt and Woody. Yes, always, always, always fun to talk Detroit sports and uh, some regional sports too with the change with the Cleveland Guardians as well. Uh, it's going to be uh, interesting though how the NFL handles the yes. upcoming season, um, and we'll see where things go. But I know so many of the fans are excited to get back into the stadium and to be able to participate. Uh, Tigers fans are excited too because I mean, look. Like I said, they're the hottest ticket in town. Who would yeah. have thought? Yeah, exactly. Tigers, you know, seven and zero homestand lately. They're, it's good. It's good baseball for once here, and AJ Hinz is doing a great job. Uh, so uh, with that, the uh, you know what else, and who else is doing a great job? The Oakland Early College. Yes. Um, we've had them on the show a few times, but they knew, have a new head of the school over at Oakland Early College for the West Bloomfield School District. Morrison Borders joins us now on the Mega Crest. Mega Cast. Great to have you with us. How are you today? Happy Friday. Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. So, as someone who's in education, do you celebrate Fridays like we do over here at the Mega Cast? <laughs> well. Well, this, uh, this time of year when you're getting ready for uh, school to start, uh, there's really no difference between a Friday and a Monday, unfortunately, uh, I, especially with all the changes and, the, and some of the uncertainties. So it's all, it's all kind of the same. So with that, uh, Morrison, we know that you're going to be the new head of school over at Oakland at Early College. We've talked uh, to your uh, previous people in your position throughout the pandemic, but for you, give us a little bit of your background and then um, your anticipation for this new role. Sure. So um, I've been in education since 2003. I actually started as a uh, as a teacher at Farmington Hills Harrison, which is interesting because Oakland Early College is just right around the corner from the former site of Harrison. Uh, then I went out to uh, Howell and I was a high school assistant principal for five years. Uh, I ran the freshman campus out there for a few years. We had about 720 freshmen. Uh, so it was a fairly large building. Holy cow. I, That's a lot I, of kids. Came, yeah, <laughs> it's a big high school out there. Um, so then I came back to West Bloomfield in 2012, uh, where, I, where I was an assistant principal at Orchard Lake Middle School, uh, and then I became principal at Orchard Lake uh, Middle School in 2013. In 2019, um, I went into central office. Didn't really like that, uh, and so I transitioned back um, into, into an administrative role with Lakers Online, where I uh, oversaw six through 12 students uh, during the pandemic there. And then um, now I'm at OEC. So you do really know that uh, uh, Morrison, since you navigated the Lakers online program throughout the pandemic, you get to add at least seven years onto your resume. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Kids, uh, a lot of kids that I've talked to at OEC so far, are like we, we can't be online anymore. And I'm like, I, I don't want to be online anymore either. So uh, we both have the same feeling. So with that, uh, we do know Oakland Early College, this is such a great program that the West Bloomfield School District offers to its students. But for those that may not be familiar with it, give us a little bit of background. It's like a jump start on their college education. Exactly, exactly. So uh, it's not only offered to West Bloomfield students, it's offered to any student in Oakland County that would like to apply to the program. Um, and so what it is in its simplest form is it's a blended experience of high school and college. So through the course of, it's, a, it's really a five-year program. So students don't end the program in 12th grade, they end the program in what we call 13th grade. And so throughout the program, they have to meet the Michigan Merit Curriculum, which is the state mandated courses that you have to have in order to receive a state endorsed diploma. But as they go, they take more and more college classes every year until really that 13th year, most of our students are taking all college courses um, and they'll have one high school course um, called 13 Seminar where they, um, where they really kind of meet to focus up. And um, by the time they're done, by the end of their coursework, um, students will graduate um, OEC with a high school diploma and up to an associate's degree. But um, in order to earn the OEC diploma, you have to have at least 30 college credits uh, which is a ton, um, and OCC affords our students lots of different opportunities. Um, you can go into different certification programs or you can earn different associate's degrees, um, and then all of that is paid for. All those college courses are all paid for um, by the district. I will tell you, that is just such an amazing program, not only for the students, but also for their parents, because when you take a look at the cost of college education today, even if it's at the community yeah. college, that's a huge cost savings. So who qualifies for this program? 
really anyone can qualify. The only, the only stipulation we have is that um, you have to have completed Algebra 1 before you can enroll in the program. So um, many of our students apply to the program in 10th and 11th grade. You can't apply to the program after you've completed your 11th grade year, so going into 12th grade, excuse me, would be too late. But we have students coming in in, in 10th and 11th grade, and just recently, um, we've opened it up to freshmen, so students can actually start the program in ninth grade. Uh, this year, we have 11 freshmen coming in as of right now. Uh, we have some more interviews and, and more applications to look through. Um, but um, Oakland Early College is a place for students who want to do school a little bit differently. Right? We're a very small feel, and as great and awesome as those college credits are, for me, that's really not what makes OEC great. What makes OEC great is the students uh, the community and culture that has been built, it, it's really a tight-knit family. Um, all the students and parents will eventually have my cell phone number. I've given it out a number of times. Uh, I did an introduction webinar and I gave it out. So not many high school students can say they have their uh, head of school or principal cell phone number. Um, but all of our teachers are 100% are focused on our students. We have a small staff, so, so uh, they are very close and Really what sets you know, Oakland Early College apart is that community feel. Um, while the college credits are great, right? If you don't have that great uh, community and culture, um, students aren't gonna have the best possible experience. So how many students does this program accept? Uh, per, currently we have, for the next school year, we have 160 students currently. Um, our cap is usually around 190. So like, we will fluctuate between that um, and Right, like I said, right now we have 160, including the students who are coming in, uh, but we could add a few more. So I know really uh, one of the goals of this is to also get the students uh, acclimated to the college campus life or the college mm -hmm. life. But to last year was a little bit different. We're hoping people are going to be in person this year. So I feel like maybe you're coming in at a good time, but if we do have to go remote, you have that handled too. Correct. Yep. So last year, what uh, OEC did is it was very similar to some other schools in the area where it was um, half the students would come in and they, so they would rotate. Um, you'd have half the students one day, half the students the next day. Um, and then so we are kind of it, it is interesting, though, because we are really tied to what uh, OCC does, because so many of our students take I mean, all of our students take college classes, even 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 our freshmen, their second semester will take one college class. And so um, that uh, that teamwork between us and OCC is very important um, to make sure that we're on the same page um, and, and, you know, they understand what we're doing and we understand what they're doing. So when we're talking about uh, the students are taking college classes in mm -hmm. high school, are we talking about our basics that when we go to college that we have to take or are these elective classes that they can kind of pick and choose from? Uh, both, actually. So um, at OCC, there's a, there's a number of art classes that our students take. Um, they have a number of theater classes. There's a culinary, um, culinary arts program there at OCC as well students can go through. Um, so really, uh, the great thing about the program is that all of our OEC students, while they're high school students and they have a high school counselor, they also have a college OCC counselor. And they talk to that counselor about where they, what universities they would like to go to, what their plan is for after college, and that uh, college counselor really guides them through, gets them into the right classes, so they're ready to move on to, to whatever their next step is in education. Morrison Borders with us here on the Megacast. He's the new head of school over at the Oakland Early College, which is uh, run out of the West Bloomfield School District. And with that, Morrison, just a minute or two here with you, going forward into this upcoming school year, <clears throat> excuse me, coming out of the pandemic, what do you anticipate the schools or the students are going to be most excited for? Is it just being in person? Okay. I've had a number of conversations with students and that, and that is exactly what it is. It's the getting back to the quote unquote normal, you know, we say, um, and being able to be on campus, see your friends on a daily basis, interact with people uh, like you used to. Because during the pandemic, a lot of students were shut off. You know, uh, you know this day and age, our, our kids, my kids, my own kids, they live their lives through electronics, right? <clears throat> so they get all that socializing at school a lot of times. and not having that opportunity really, really set some students back. So I think students um, and staff for that matter are super excited to be back in person. 
ready to, to get back to doing things that they love to do um, and not, you know, talking through, uh, talking through the camera. Oh, isn't that the truth? But uh, what are the logistics involved in this and trying to coordinate the days that they're at the high school versus days that they're on the college campus? And what about transportation? Yeah, so actually our, our um, school is located at OCC. We are on OCC's campus. So as students begin to progress and they take more and more college classes, they base that off of what their high school schedule is. So um, we, have a, we have a very flexible schedule where in the afternoons, so we have a six period school day, which most, most, co- most high schools do, but we alternate fifth and sixth hour as a two hour block. So students have the ability to take those college classes in the afternoon on maybe a Monday and a Wednesday or a Tuesday and a Thursday. Um, and we have some, some great activities that we do on Fridays. So it's really their high school schedule and college schedule are really just melded together. Um, and and they're, not, they're not two separate things. They're one schedule um, that's created um, for them every year. It has to be so cool to say, I'm a high school student, but I'm in college. Yep. <laughs> they de- I mean, you know, it's, it's, I've had the opportunity to be around uh, OEC for many years. Um, I was I'm very good friends with the, with the past head of school, Jen- Jennifer Newman, and I've done a number of activities down there over the years. And the students at OEC have always been just awesome. You walk in, they're, they're in your face in a good way, right? They're, they introduce themselves, they shake your hand, you know, it's, they are, uh, they're a great group of kids, and and they really love the school, and, and they love, um, you know, what opportunities OEC has has given them. Morrison Borders with us here on the Mega Cast. He's the new head of the school over at Oakland Early at College. And Morrison, we want to say congratulations on the promotion and best of luck in your new role. All right, great. Thank you very much. It was great talking to you guys today. A happy summer to you. I hope you get a little bit time off. Uh, to enjoy the, uh, the hopefully what becomes a nice Michigan uh, summer. <laughs> so, eventually, hopefully. Yeah, I know. We're all in that together. But uh, you and uh, the team over there uh, at the school district, all educators have really deserved and earned a break. So, with that, uh, we want to say thank you again for your time. We'll take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, Dr. Faust will be with us here on the Megacast to talk about uh, not just COVID, but the new outbreak of Legionnaires disease here in Oakland County. That's next here on the Megacast. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get vaccinated? I'd like to go to these school dances and spring break to have fun. I want to be in person for college next semester. I want to get out of this pandemic. I wanted to protect the people around me. Why did you get vaccinated? Because I'm really looking forward to hanging out with my friends. I just want to go to a show, dance around, not have to worry about anything, feel like I'm free again. So we can not miss out on the best years of our life. How does marijuana affect the teen brain? Our brains are still developing into our 20s. With regular use, marijuana can affect teen brain development. It can affect our brain's circuitry and blood flow and impair thinking, learning, and memory function. Which could hold us back from reaching our potential. Don't let marijuana mess with your brain. Get the facts at michigan.gov slash drug free. Thank you for being with us on the Megacast. Just about uh, 15, 20 minutes left here in the Friday edition of the show. And as a reminder, um, you can always catch uh, previous episodes of the show. Just go to civiccentertv.com, click on the Megacast uh, tab, or if you just want to catch an individual interview, go ahead and go to the on-demand section and you'll find it posted there. And you know, we've talked so much about COVID-19 
throughout uh, this pandemic with, you know, uh, which we should be doing. I mean, yes. that's why the show was developed, was to talk about the pandemic. But we should also note that right now, here in Oakland County and in the state of Michigan, we're seeing an uptick in cases of Legionnaire's disease. And I think because of COVID-19 and obviously all the talk with the Delta variant, it maybe isn't getting the attention that it deserves. So with that, we want to bring in uh, Dr. Russell Faust back with us again here on the Megacast. Of course, he's the medical director over at Oakland County Health Division. And uh, Dr. Faust, thank you again for being with us. But for those that aren't familiar with Legionnaire's disease, what exactly is it? Great question, and good to see you again, Ronnie, and thanks for the invitation to join you. Um, so Legionnaire's disease is um, a, an infection caused by a bacterium um, that can cause um, two different clinical entities. The first is Legionnaire's disease, which is um, a pneumonia, and it can also be infection in other areas of the body. Um, and the other is actually named for Pontiac, Michigan. So Pontiac um, disease. And that is um, all of the symptoms. It can have GI symptoms and, and uh, fatigue and headache and aches and pains, uh, but without the, without the pneumonia. Um, and that is the, the Pontiac's, uh, Pontiac disease is really self-limited. Doesn't require treatment with antibiotics. It's not a, um, a severe infection and the body's immune system generally takes care of that. Um, Legionnaires, on the other hand, can be quite severe and, and a serious infection. You know, that, that pneumonia can be fatal, in fact. Um, so it requires antibiotics and the vast majority of those people end up being hospitalized. Dr. Faust, I'm so glad that we have you on. And I will say, this is the first time I've heard of Pontiac disease and we live here and it came out of this area. How does one contract uh, Pontiac disease or Legionnaires? Where does it come from? That's a great question. Uh, you know, it is one of the many um, microbes that live in water. And so, you know, we, we first became familiar with it um, at a, uh, a Legionnaires convention, and I believe it was a, a hotel in Philadelphia, and um, a number of these Legionnaires became infected with uh, a pneumonia, and the CDC began to do the investigation, and it became um, clear that it was the result of uh, bacteria in the cooling tower for that hotel. And there were, um, hundreds and hundreds of legionnaires meeting at this convention and a, a large number of them became infected with pneumonia and um and a, a fair number um died from this so that that brought it to the world's attention um subsequently we see um a level of legionnaires disease on an annual basis and it peaks somewhere usually around August, September. Um, and this year, because, well, we can speculate why this would be, but the peak seems to be moving a little bit earlier. That is, um, you know, here we are June, July, and we're starting to see these cases peak. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and, and there are, are a number of factors involved that be happy to, to kind of speculate. But you know, for a year and a half, people have been essentially working from home. They haven't been going into work. They haven't been in, in places that have these complex water systems. Your residential water system in your house is used often enough. It's flushed. And um, although Legionella might be in that system, it's flushed and it, is not um it is not a risk of exposure the the complex water systems that we have in these large buildings um, especially if they sit stagnant for a long time risk legionella building up in the system and um and certainly these systems have been stagnant unused for an extended period now through the pandemic people are going back to work now there's a greater exposure risk potentially and um, in addition, 
CDC tells us that wet and warm conditions increase the risk of exposure. So, you know, here we are, we, obviously we've had a couple of floods. And if I go back and, and look historically at the weather, um, which I just happened to do late yesterday, um, if we don't have the full July to look at, but if we go back a month and compare June of 2021 to let's say June of 2019, we're looking at more than double the amount of rainfall in June. And we're looking at an average, when we look at the average temperature across the month of June, the average temperature of this year versus 2019 is up six degrees Fahrenheit. So we're talking warmer, wetter weather, and, and people you know, are, are uh, exposed because of that. The folks that are at risk, we really should talk about these. And I, I hate to call this elderly um, because I'm in this category, but anybody above the age of 50 is at greater risk. Anybody who has previously or currently smokes tobacco is at greater risk. Anybody who's immunocompromised is at greater risk or has chronic uh, pulmonary disease, you know, emphysema, et cetera. So, um, you know, the CDC, the um, MDHHS issued a press release saying that, you know, we had this enormous increase in cases this July versus last year. Well, of course we do. People were home last year this time. Um, so if we, if we look from say July to July, not the calendar year, but July to July, we go back one year from now, of course there were virtually no cases last year. If we go back the year prior to that, um, we have a bump in cases from then to now. Of um, it's Again, it's warmer, it's wetter. So we have a bump in cases. But if we go back another year, um, 2018, we're actually down by about 24% in case numbers. So it, it fluctuates year to year. I will say this, for the last 20 years, there's been just a gradual increase in case numbers, um, nationally, statewide, and countywide. So if I can act, uh, ask you, doctor, because um... For so many of us, we didn't really hear of Legionnaire's disease until the Flint water crisis. So right. now when we hear it, there's a panic that comes with uh, hearing Legionnaire's disease. So uh, is there a way to avoid getting it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if people have things like hot tubs or more complex water systems in their homes, they basically need to um, keep the pH correct and disinfection correct uh, uh, per manufacturer's instructions. But again, in residential homes, it's not really a risk. The risks tend to be, um, and I didn't include this in the kind of the, the list of folks, the demographic that are at risk, but folks that also are, are traveling. You know, as we go back through our case numbers, uh, that's one of the questions that our epidemiologists ask people is whether they've been traveling, whether they've been staying in hotels, whether they've been using hot tubs in hotels or gyms, things like that. So though, those are potential exposures. Um, but in general, in our own homes, that's not a risk. Um, the, the risk is we know that Legionella, as with a number of other bacteria, are in water and in water supplies. Um, so anytime we're around water that's been aerosolized, misted, then that's a potential exposure. So this isn't coming from, is it coming from drinking water as well? So sh is it better if uh, to take bottled water from our home? It can come from drinking water, yes. You know, when, when we have um, cases identified to us, <clears throat> when we're called with cases, um, We'll do a, our epidemiologist will do a very, very detailed interview, examination. And, um, you know, if you think about where you've been in the last two weeks, boy, it's a long list of places potentially. Right, it's and hard so to that, remember where I was yesterday, to. right? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, we find out where they've been um, and then we'll go out and inspect those places potentially and find out whether there is a, a common um, exposure Certainly if we have more than one case 
and they have a um, they have a location in common, then we absolutely have our environmental health um, experts go out and, and conduct an examination and inspection of those sites. So have we found, how many cases in Oakland County recently, and have you found that one common denominator in any of these cases? We haven't. We haven't. Wow. Um, we actually, as of 4.30 this morning, we are up to 18 cases for this month. Um, we have 30 cases total for the year, for the calendar year, wow. um, which, you know, again, looking back, is not that unusual. Um, but of course, given the the state's experience with Flint, you know they're they're going to be notifying people in a press release. Um, what is a little bit interesting is that our cases range from age 26 up into the 90s. Um, and in looking back, I've gone through our cases for the last three or four years. Looking back, generally they they do fall above the age of 50. Um, and so we've, we've had a couple cases, um, two years ago, we had some that were in the twenties. Um, and, and again, virtually all of these, um, all but two were hospitalized in the 30 that I'm talking about this year, all huh. but two were hospitalized. Um, so it's a, it's, you know, it's something that if, if someone believes that they've been, you know, say in the backyard messing with the fountain and then within the next week or two they're you know they have headaches they're coughing um and and you know weak and feel like you know they're ill they need to um they need to contact their their physician or go to urgent care or the er and and say you know i, I may have been exposed to aerosolized misted water and i've got this they'll and they'll be examined and, and checked out for uh, for legionnaires is two things that um, they'll look for pneumonia, and they do. They conduct a um, a test on urine. It's a it's an easy. It's almost like a pregnancy test. You know, the little card. It's a it's a urine dipstick basically for the antigen from the bacteria. So it's a quick test then. A very easy quick test. Dr. Russell Faust with us here on the Megacast. He's a medical director over at Oakland County Health Division. And um, Dr. Faust, can I ask, uh, at what point in time should someone understand that they need to seek medical help? Oh, always if somebody has shortness of breath, anytime anybody for whatever they think the reason might be, if they're short of breath, they have difficulty um, with exertion, you know, climbing the usual flight of stairs it is normally not a problem for them, then they need to seek attention. Uh, just another minute or two here with you, yep. uh, Dr. Faust, and I know that um, uh, we brought you on to talk about Legionnaires, but uh, I want to ask you if we could kind of jump back to COVID-19, because with the Delta variant spreading so rapidly, uh, a friend asked me this the other day, I was like, I don't know, if someone is vaccinated, should they still go ahead and wear a mask due to the concerns of the Delta variant, or if they do, at least if they're going to be in like a large crowd? So here's the, the issue with masks. You know, wearing a mask really protects those around you from you potentially being infected with COVID-19. It, it prevents those respiratory droplets that I'm generating right now talking. It prevents those respiratory droplets from, you know, from getting out and exposing those around you. The mask isn't isn't as protective as we would like to protect us from being exposed to others, unless you're wearing an N95 mask right. that is you know, sealed and fitted and, and um, is very good at filtering out particulate. Um, the issue right now is that we know that we're at about 70% vaccinated in Oakland County. But when I go out, and, and that and that people who are unvaccinated should be wearing masks. But when I go out into the store, firstly, 100% are unmasked. Yeah. So we know that there are folks around us all the time that are unvaccinated, that are not wearing masks. Really, the issue is, um, those people are at risk for being infected with COVID-19, but specifically Delta variant. 
We know that they're highly vulnerable and we know that it's very easily transmitted, which means even those of us who are fully vaccinated are at greater risk because it's so easily transmitted. Um, and so I just ask folks that if they're not vaccinated, they should be wearing a mask. Um, and, and more than that, I've said it a million times, every active infection is a factory that's generating mutations. Yeah. It's, it's producing variants. So we just need to be vaccinated. We need 100% vaccinated. You know, 70% was a great goal. It's great to be there. Um, but everybody needs to be vaccinated because this is just going to continue on as, as infected people produce variants. And the longer it continues, the longer we remain in the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Absolutely. Faust, it's been so great having you and your expertise and your guidance throughout this pandemic, but also to alert us to other things going on. We want to say thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation to be here. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of the Mega Cast. It's been quite the long week. Tyler, uh, go enjoy the weekend. Yes, Take a break. Enjoy too. it. Get out on the water. Do something fun. And we will be back here Monday starting at 10 a.m.